It's not every day that some new seasonal anime impresses this much on launch, and I'm not going to bore you with a prolonged introduction. We're here to talk about direction and highlight a few scenes in Jellyfish Can't Swim at Night's first episode that highlight examples of standout direction. Direction is, most simply, how a story's ideas are conveyed through the tools of their medium, and Jellyfish's director, Ryohei Takashita, has a truly great sense on how to tie ideas together in really interesting ways. Let's start with something simple. How do you key the audience into a flashback? Off the top of your head, you can probably think of dozens of examples because there's no one way to do it. Match cut with a new date, rewind effect, throw a filter up, jump cut it, clock hands spiraling backwards, and infinite other choices because there's no one answer. But I really like the one that Jellyfish utilizes. We get to see a young, slightly glowing Yoru running through the space occupied by the present day one. This is pretty innocuous on its face, an efficient transition to a new scene, clearly carrying the themes of the conversation about wanting to be chosen into the flashback about being chosen, and an obvious visual separation of desire with past versus present moving in opposite directions. But I think this choice really comes into its own in the follow-up, where present Yoru tracks her past self in front of the mural, as though she is physically there. This has it take on a kind of haunting interpretation. Yoru's memories are unavoidable, almost tangible, in the space of Shibuya. Her relationship to this mural taking on an almost traumatic bent, and the choice to cut to flashback via an almost ghostly representation gives it a sense of unfinished business that she hasn't come to terms with. This isn't a past that she is beyond if she can track her younger self with her present eyes and a feeling almost like she could interact with it, but won't because of what she took away from sharing this mural with her friends. That's a small directional choice working in tandem using the same style to build to greater meaning, but what about when the setup is actually different than the payoff? Jellyfish's first example of an imagined future occurs when Yoru is telling her Discord buddy about what she expects her life to be after her schooling. The stuff that clues us in that it's the future, beyond the obvious age up and the animal heads, the blur on the edges of the screen that draw us towards the center and are a clear visual distinction from how the show handles what is in focus. It's really apparent in this shot, there's practically a vignette laid on top, which is pretty standard for telling an audience that what is shown is not chronological or literal. This is nothing special, though this cut of animation is excellent, except for how it contrasts so well with our next imagined future. We're going to be coming back to this moment a lot because part of the way the show connects ideas is using setting, and there's a repeat down the line, but upon seeing the idol performing in front of the jellyfish, we get an interesting cut to a train car, followed by what seems to be a normal interjection until the tape pauses and rewinds to tell us that that was imaginary. I mention this moment because that kind of subversion, the implication that it was real up until it wasn't, takes on a this is what I want to do but won't tone that feels all the more glum because we weren't clued into the fact that it wasn't real. Jellyfish has kept the audience in the loop the entire time to this point, and in a world where it has a clear vignette and palette shift, it's probably played for comedy. In fact, another show might do the same action as Jellyfish does here and play Play it for a laugh. But here, that ever so slight deception matches the action of Yoru imagining that and then ad hoc rationalizing not doing so. It's kind of a bummer. And then, almost perfectly in accordance with our previous discussion about the past, young Yoru crossing her name out appears to represent this emotional conflict, before bubbling into light when Kano defends the mural's honor, seeming to resolve, at least for a moment, Yoru's problem. This is great stuff, cashing in yet again on the directional choice to portray the past in that way, even as it differs fundamentally from its previous uses. We know that this is not the end of Yoru's dilemma because of a following scene which, well, let's follow up on that train car, shall we? But first, if you want to be stylish like the characters in Jellyfish, might I recommend taking a look at the new Team Liquid and Death Note collab. The folks at TL, which has been my favorite LCS team and general esports org since about 2018, sent me some swag from it, including this ridiculously cool jacket, and I thought even though they said I didn't have to, aka the shoutout is not in exchange for money or the stuff I got, I wanted to show them some love here. There's a link to the collection in the description. And after that extremely cool and normal segue, we actually get two train shots in that previous scene one prior to the imagined defense, and then another as Kano is walking away and Yoru watches her go, before resolving to chase. At this point, I think the motif is pretty malleable. There are a few possible meanings for it, but it's not firm yet. 
That changes in what I would argue is the best way as Kano and Yoru chat on the overpass. This scene is great. I love the color bokeh that flickers, the tracking shot on the earbuds, and everything about the way distance is portrayed, that previous shot being one example, but our establishing is great length and Kano cutting in, the soft focus on the phone getting so personal, the fingers are out of our focal length, the way the music starts to swell and soar as Kano invites Yoru to the jelly project, and... Taking all of the momentum out of the scene, cutting the song before it can resolve, it's expectation destroying in the best way. And suddenly our little train cuts from earlier are more strongly defined with self-doubt and the action Yoru should take but doesn't. We get right back to her denial moments later, in which the train is more or less made textual as a vehicle for running away. This shot in particular I love since Yoru crosses over Kano watching from afar, drawing your eyes to her, and since the camera stays on her, you're inclined to stick with it there as well, tying into the next zoom shot. Just a really well-composed and storyboarded sequence. The reason I love the quick interlude to the train beyond the earlier point about taking the energy out is that it now frames the overpass conversation in the past, making this a moment of regret instead of the start of something grand. It works from a plot perspective either way. You could certainly recut this so that there's no train until Yoru descends the staircase, but I think the choice to have the train take on this motif is more interesting, and that's all that one can really ask for. And the way that everything that follows is more set in stone. There's nothing to hope for as an audience because you know how it's going to end, which is important for the tone it sets and the following sequences. But if you ask me what my favorite way that Jellyfish connects ideas in this episode is, I'd have to tell you it's not motifs or sound or setting even, it's a camera move. Obviously, this is not a literal camera move, we're talking about animation, but I mean that the way that the theoretical camera, our perspective, is carried through a sequence. We just got done talking about the overpass, and there's a ton of great shots, but after Yoru declines, we get this really technically impressive cut with a descent into a rotation and a push. It is designed, in my opinion, to express the distance between the two girls, even though they were so close together moments ago, and also to highlight their hands on the railing, since Yoru's hands are the things that both drew the jellyfish and also blotted out her name. And the shot that I think connects them, even though we drop the elevation, is when Kano is singing in front of the jellyfish. There are a lot of other connections here, the setting obviously being the same as the previous Idol performance, one set we haven't even touched on is the Halloween outfits, but this shot with a similar rotation and similar push I find serves as a callback to that shot on the overpass. While Kano's attempt to bridge their gap failed before, here it succeeds even though the literal distance between them is larger. The framing of the shots goes even closer, filling the entire screen with their faces at the start and end of the movement. It might seem odd to focus on this since Yaru technically does not decide to run forward until after a different way to view the past, this time a kind of film filter that is effectively the runtime of the episode and a double exposure that honestly I just don't love the combo of, and the silent words now made audible which is much better but I think it speaks to Jellyfish's variety in communicating visual ideas. If you think that I'm exaggerating about these connections, that these are incidental, and that I'm stretching, well, I've saved the coup de grace for last. You might not have noticed, but the Jellyfish mural is right below Train Tracks, a unification in setting of the representation of running away and the very thing that Yoru is running away from. But it is in this moment, as Yoru runs forward, that she shatters that connection, no longer running away from her past and in fact resolving by drawing on it to continue. I genuinely love stories that have these multi-purpose connections, setting, symbolism, character development, and even the shot types, all wrapped into just the location for a climactic scene that really only has to execute on what had already been introduced. It's almost short story-esque with how tightly it's been built, and that kind of thinking and utilization leads to stories with tons of stuff worth pulling out and talking about. The performance is also great, but I don't think you need me to tell you that, and it isn't lost on me that the episode ends with Kana and Yoru sprinting under the tunnel that Yoru had once brought her friends through to crush her spirit, now going the opposite way, spirits renewed. There are more moments worth talking about, symbolism like the lipstick introduced early on, brought back in the Halloween outfit and then used to draw eyes on the jellyfish, the angel and devil motif set up again in the intro, Kano leaving Yoru with only one option, and then them on Halloween. The rule of threes that set up, remind, and execute in this episode are crazy common. I didn't even really talk about the characters in regard to how the story is written, which is like 50% of its strength. But again, this was a pretty broad overview of just some of the stuff that stuck out to me from a direction perspective. Because at the end of the day, you should just 
just watch Jellyfish for yourself and enjoy the direction, the motific development, and killer animation, and the stuff I didn't talk about, all that good writing. That's it. That's the video. Bye. <laughs> That's it. That's the video.